On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite Dr. Linda hassan Fratz to address convocation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's just a real pleasure and honor for me to be here this afternoon to receive this honorary degree. It means a great deal to me, particularly given, as you've heard, that uh, Western is my alma mater, both for my undergrad and my MBA. So this makes a full, full set. So first, uh, a few words about Lindemar. You heard uh, a little bit uh, already. Lindemar is a diversified, advanced manufacturing company. What does that mean? It means we're trying to take the latest in technology, much of it enabled by the enormous power of computing and low cost of sensors that have evolved over the last few years, and marry that up with our deep manufacturing expertise that we've developed over the last 50 years to come up with really fantastic solutions for our customers in our target markets. We're about 75% focused on uh, the automotive and commercial vehicle markets, and about 25% on industrial markets, such as harvesting equipment and uh, access equipment like scissor lifts, boom lifts, and telehandlers. Sales, as you heard last year, was $7.6 billion, and 2019 is shaping up to be another record year for us, despite some soft markets. 2018 was our ninth consecutive year of double-digit earnings growth, something that we're very, very proud of. We have close to 28,000 employees globally. We're manufacturing today in 11 countries, 60 facilities. About 40% of our plants are right here in Canada, which has proven to be an excellent place to manufacture where we have a globally competitive workforce. We were founded right here in Canada in the mid-60s, as you heard, by my father, Frank Hassenfratz. He came to Canada in the late 50s from his native Hungary, penniless, but with an important asset, with a skill. He's a certified machinist, which he levered to start a business and just relentlessly drive it for continuous growth. He really is an incredible entrepreneur. He's been hugely inspirational to me and continues to be every single day and has helped really shape my own leadership style. We've tried to build a company at Linamar with a solid culture, with, with clear values of who we are and how we want to do business. For example, we try to approach our business in a very balanced way, always balancing the needs of our customers, our employees, and our shareholders. We are very entrepreneurial, just like our founder. You'll find that uh, all of, all of uh, our leaders in Linamar are very entrepreneurial, opportunistic. They are very respectful of our people, which is something we've learned from day one responsive, we move quick, we get answers back quickly to our customers, and we have a culture that's really grounded in hard work and grounded, importantly, in innovation. And I think that this culture is really just such a key element to our success, along, of course, with our ability to remain competitive, which again tracks back to our ability to be innovative and to be efficient in how we run our operations. Our success is also, of course, about opportunities. So that's about the strategy that we've developed of what we're going to do, where we're going to do it, how we're going to compete. And that all comes together to help create our success. So culture, competitiveness, and opportunity are really the keys to success, I think, in any business. And of course, it all only happens when we have a, a great, strong bench of wonderful leaders uh, in the company, which I'm really proud to say that we do have. You know, I've learned a, a lot on, on my journey uh, about how to be an effective leader. I'm often asked, is, is good leadership genetic or, or learned? And I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think you need to have a little kernel of something in you of a leader to walk into a situation and be able to take charge, to have a, a vision and rally people uh, around you. But I do, I do think that natural instinct isn't enough. I think that there's a need to really hone those skills and develop your individual leadership styles. I learned a lot about leadership from some great leaders, and I encourage you to seek out those great leaders as you head out into your careers as well. Of course, I learned an enormous amount from my father. He's all about do it today, move quickly, know your costs, care about cash, build relationships, grow, find opportunities everywhere. We have uh, a president and chief operating officer, Jim Gerald. He's an amazing leader, also a Western grad, by the way. And he inspires me every day as well with his amazing skills around negotiation and selling and creativity and how we're going to do things and marketing. 
I've learned a lot from my husband. He's uh, Ed Newton, he's also here today, and is also an entrepreneur. He helps to keep me grounded, keep me thinking practically, and thinking about innovation and the importance of innovation in technology. You know, at Littimer, we've actually spent a lot of time thinking about what does make a great leader, because as we've grown, as I say, we only can grow successfully if we have a great bench of leaders. So we, we wanted to articulate what is it we're looking for in those leaders, and we've identified six sort of attributes of, of a leader that we're looking for. Passion, of course, is one of them, somebody who can uh, get, is excited about the vision that they've created and can, can uh, and make that uh, excitement infectious. Somebody who's a good planner, figuring out how you're going to get to that goal. You can't just have a goal, you have to figure out how you're going to get there. And then someone who's good at executing, so getting things done. Good decision makers who have edge and acumen, they can handle tough situations, they make insightful decisions for their business, leaders that are good communicators and that really care about their people. Because we, be, we really believe that if leaders don't show that they care about uh, the people that work for them, they're going to have a tough time having them follow them. Now, you know, you're not going to necessarily be a leader or a star in every one of those areas, right? It's the odd leader that is uh, that can uh, exhibit all six of those attributes. But really, it's about putting a team together that exhibits all that. So if you're really strong in one area, complement your team with people who are strong in some of those uh, other areas. Your team should reflect the leadership characteristics that you don't have. Now, there's uh, more, uh, obviously more than that to successful leadership. And, and I think a really key piece to being a successful leader is making good decisions. I mentioned uh, edge and acumen around decisions, insightful decisions. And I think there's really four key things here that you should try to remember. The first is know when to spend more time and when less time on a decision. I think that an easy way to think about it is that the time you spend on the decision should be proportionate to the consequence of the decision, right? So if the consequence is, you know, today, tomorrow, this week, spend seconds on that decision. But if the consequence can be years, then you should spend some time studying and thinking about what are the alternatives and making the right decision. That might sound really obvious, but you'd be surprised how many companies spend weeks or months deciding about something that they should have decided in minutes, and others that make snap decisions on things that can affect them for many years. You know, I think that companies can die a, a slow death buried in a sea of bureaucracy, but they can also die a quick and fiery death from poor strategic decision making. So think about that when you're out there making decisions. The second thing I think is to make decisions weighing them in the context of, of all, all the important stakeholders. So I talked about customers, employees, shareholders, maybe your community, maybe your suppliers. If you're in a big company, it's about your facility, your group, you know, your, the overall company, you need to weigh the decision in regards to each of those. I think the third key thing around good decision making is challenging. You need to challenge others. If you're in a position where you're being asked to make a decision about something, it means you've got some knowledge that maybe others don't have. So challenge it. You're not a rubber stamp. Just don't just approve everything that's put in front of you. Ask for new ideas. Ask for alternatives. Understand why. Keep asking why until you're satisfied uh, that this really is the best solution. And above all, I think that good leaders really own uh, their decisions, right? So right or wrong, you know, good leaders fight for what they think is right, but openly admit when they've made a mistake and take that on their own shoulders, not on somebody else's. Now, I think this brings up a, a good point around the importance of database decision making as well, which I want to expand on a little bit more. You know, I think that I feel like we live in a time when we have more information available to us than we ever have in history, and yet I feel in many ways we're less informed than we've ever been. We tend to, information's coming at us every second, and we tend to just believe what we read and believe what we hear, uh, instead of challenging that. And that's something that I, I really want you to take away from today, to think about when I read something, and when I read a statistic, when I read data, or, or read a, an article on the internet, do I believe that? Uh, let me understand where that comes from. Challenge it a little bit. Uh, again, challenge, understand uh, the origin of that data. So as an example, the statistical definition of a manufacturing company here in Canada is a business in which at least 50% of the employees are physically touching product. Now, that's a, that 
may have been a good uh, definition of manufacturing 50 or 100 years ago, but today we're a manufacturing company. We barely meet this definition. You know, we have a, a lot of automation that is doing the more repetitive kind of jobs uh, in, our in our factories and letting our people do more creative, more interesting jobs around improvement and planning and logistics and negotiation and, and uh, maintenance and all kinds of other uh, more interesting areas. It means you could literally automate your way out of being defined as a manufacturing company. So if you read, oh, there's less manufacturing in Canada today than there was in the past, question it. Where does that statistic come from? What does it mean? You know, fact-based decision-making also means not looking at a trend line and concluding that everybody's following that same trend. I mean, you could see, uh, you could see a graph that the, the line is completely flat, but that might be a bunch of people doing this and a bunch of other people doing that, right? We can't just conclude that everybody is uh, performing at the average. I think that's the danger of averages. You know, your, your head is in the freezer, your feet are in, are in the oven, like on average, good. You know, in reality, not, not so good. So don't generalize and draw conclusions on face value without really understanding how is this calculated, where is this coming from, and challenge a little bit. I think another good example is looking at sort of the bigger picture when we're trying to make decisions and understand what the right, uh, right future is. A good example is battery electric vehicles. You know, there's a lot of hype and, and focus on battery electric vehicles as being the right future for automotive, but that's because they think that they're green, they're better for the environment, but in fact, that's only true if the electricity source in that country is green. And in fact, in many countries in the world, the United States, China, India, many parts of Europe, the majority of the electricity comes from coal or gas-fired electricity plants. Happily in Canada, that's not the case. We have a, a significant percentage of renewable energy, so electric vehicles can make a difference. But in some of these other countries, if you look at a, a well-to-wheels perspective, also including the, the emissions generated from making of the uh, fuel, the well-to-wheels emissions of a battery electric vehicle are not dissimilar to that of a diesel engine. So think about the facts, understand the facts, look at the big picture. Don't just look at one little slice of a story. Think about the whole thing in order to really, again, make good decisions. Okay, I'm sure you've heard enough from me about decision making uh, and are anxious to get on with the ceremony and your very well-earned celebrations after that. But if you can indulge me for just a couple minutes, I just want to leave you with a couple of pieces of advice. First, never stop learning. And you heard that from your chancellor just a minute ago. Just because you finished school doesn't mean there isn't still a lot to learn. I try and learn something new every day if I can. Be inquisitive. If you don't understand something, ask. Don't be afraid to ask somebody for help. People like to help. They like to be, they like it if you call them up and say, can you help, help me understand this, walk me through this. You're going to look a lot more foolish if you make a bad decision because you didn't understand something than asking a question at the time. Second, embrace change. Don't be afraid to change and improve. Complacency leads to obsolescence. The world, technology are changing every single day at an incredible pace, much faster than it ever did in the past, and our businesses, our strategies, how we do things has to move accordingly. You know, the, there's a saying, you can be on the right road, but you'll get run over if you just sit there. I encourage you to be a promoter of change. Do that in the businesses and in the careers uh, that you embark on. Uh, it'll make them a success, and that'll make you a, su a success as well. Third, don't be afraid of a challenge. I've been presented with many challenges in my career. I've moved through a lot of different disciplines, every time starting back at square one, not knowing how to do that job with a brand new team of people that I needed to convince that I could do, that I would work hard and be part of the team uh, and, uh, and make good decisions. And with each success, I think you grow a little bit stronger. You grow a little more confident. And with each team whose respect you've earned, you've got a whole new network of people you can draw on in your future. I think that taking on a challenging job really you know, pushes your limits a little bit. I think it lets you outperform. There's a lot of data out there that if you set your expectations high, you achieve more. The same goes for a job. If you don't know how to do something exactly, that's okay. You know, take it on. You will stretch, you will grow, uh, and you'll figure it out. 
don't be afraid to take on a lateral move. In fact, I encourage taking on lateral moves and really understanding different aspects of the organization. And finally, I, I, I would recommend you to approach the issues you face in your job with, with innovation, with ingenuity, and with common sense. Try, try and approach a decision or solution as if it was your business, if it was your money. Think about if I owned this business and this was my money, how much would I spend? What decision would I take? That's absolutely valued in today's, today's world. So learn, embrace both change and challenge, be innovative, act like an owner. I hope you can use this advice as you all embark on your careers. And if that sounds like you, we would love to hear from you at recruiter at linamar.com. <laughs> Congratulations to all of you on your success, and I wish you the best in your future.